you and I come from Nigeria, right? You might mm -hmm. recognize this. See? Yes. When a man or woman does something wrong back home, mm. his, his, his other half will go to the pastor, right? Yes. Yes. And the pastor will say, it is your mother-in-law. Yes. <laughs> Don't blame the man or the woman. It is the mother-in-law yes. that's the problem. So it takes away the responsibility. So they yes. start to fire prayer the mother-in-law <laughs> as a problem. And then the mother-in-law dies. And you think that there's peace. And they say, no, 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 no. She's still after you from the grave. <laughs> so it is not, it is not your fault. It is the fault of the mother-in-law. And when you would have prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing is happening. Then the pastor will come and say, look, it is the devil. We have to fight the devil, devil. Because the devil is the one that is causing this problem. So at no point do you become responsible for your action. It is no. always somebody else's fault. Okay. Fire where you are, right? Okay. And we have built this culture up of no responsibility, right? I was telling somebody many years ago that Nigeria is one of the few countries I know where people will go to vote on Saturday. The result gets announced on Saturday night, for example. And on Sunday, they're in church, praying that God should touch the heart of the politician yes. to, do the, to do the right thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> that God, please touch this man. They are not asking the man to be accountable, but they want God to go and touch so that the, mm. devil, the devil will not use him against us. Okay. Right? And that is what we'll do for the next four years. And then oh, we'll go back man. again and do the same thing, right? So we don't accept responsibility. It comes back to what I said. In my view, we are a traumatized continent. Okay. And all these things are reflective of the trauma we have gone through. Mm. The trauma has been caused by our colonial masters. We, they cannot, we cannot divorce them. They have been caused by our own leaders who have, who have done a lot of things to us. But they have also been caused by our followers okay. by simply not doing the right thing. So we're traumatized. Okay. And that is why some of the things we do does not make sense. Logically, wow. they don't make sense because we're traumatized. Okay. And we need to come to a place of healing, in my view, for us to move forward. Hi, right, Shala. Wow. How are you? I'm very well. Very well. Oh, yeah? Uh, quite a lot going on, but yeah, I'm fine. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. Oh, man. Every, every day, the news is... Uh, interesting you know challenging right in, in challenge exactly exactly we, we are we are constantly challenged let me increase the size of my screen yeah okay yeah yeah you know uh we have been talking about so many things it's good uh we're, we're, we're having that discussion to, here today you know yeah it, it, it's good i mean uh, the offline conversations are very interesting too mm. to be honest um, mm. and there's quite a lot going on you know yeah. Sometimes it makes your head spin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man. See, they for me, when I look at the events in the Western world, yeah. And I look at the events in Africa. Yeah. Uh sometimes, not sometimes, most times I get concerned for us back home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you mean back home or even back in home. the diaspora? Well, let's leave, let's leave diaspora, okay? okay. We, we have a, a different challenge, <laughs> <laughs> okay? Uh, okay. For me, I, I look at home because uh, I believe that this century is Africa's century. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly 100% sure of that, okay. okay? But there are events that if we don't handle them correctly yeah uh we'll be lying to ourselves uh, in fact we'll go backwards yeah now we've talked about this the recent uh mil military coups in so many countries of africa yeah and the way uh, young people talk about democracy. Yeah, you know. First of all, let's 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 leave what the young people say about democracy. <laughs> okay. what, what what's your view about 
African leadership yeah. and governance? You know, can I ask an interesting question because, and it's such a multi faceted question when you talk about <laughs> leadership and governance within Africa. And the reason why I say that is because we are so different, even mm. though some of our challenges are similar. Okay. But I think when you look at leadership in Africa, the, the, the issue I see today is the fact that there's a lot of, um, we have not weaned ourselves out of this idea of a strongman leadership. Mm. We have mm. not yet come out of that cycle where yeah. we have this idea that we need to be whipped into compliance. Yes. Yeah. We need someone to beat us up so that we can do the right thing. And we are yet to come to terms with the fact that it is strong institutions yeah. that create strong leaders, Okay, that create strong countries. But we are looking for strong leadership. And, you know, I don't know when I mentioned this to you before, but it reminds me so much of a conversation a, 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 many, many years ago when I was in, in Nigeria. Um, an itinerant pastor came to one of the churches I was going to okay, and gave a sermon. And that sermon was about why was it that the, the Jews couldn't reconcile Jesus as okay. a savior. What was it about that was difficult for them to understand, to accept? Mm. And what he said, that, and, has stood, and that has stayed with me for so, 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 I mean, I'm talking of things that are over 20 years. Yeah. I heard this. And the guy said, because the Jews had in their mind that the savior that would come would be a warrior, yeah. a fighter, and would defeat the Romans and set them free. Yeah. And here they were, there was this guy who dressed in loincloth, mm. tell, told stories, and told them that they should turn the other cheek when they were struck. And it confused them because that's not what they were looking for. They wanted yeah. a strong leader. Yeah. And for us, we are still in this place that we have a vision in our mind what leadership should be. And when people see that we we gravitate towards that that is leadership right mm. it's a strong person yes but we need to invest in 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 institutions that will make that difference yeah but that will require a strong followership okay and we are not ready to accept that responsibility okay and the other thing again which is important i think is that we need to come to terms with the fact that what we seek may not happen in our lifetime yeah. but we have to be ready to make that sacrifice of a journey yeah but we are very short term in resort seeking yeah so we want a leader that would deliver their promises today right but let me let me give you an interesting scenario about okay some of the countries in africa when it comes to leadership right one of the things you see when you go to the to the rest of the world especially europe yeah is that the opposition in many of these developed countries are always aware of what is going on, even though they are not in power. Yeah. Because the whole idea is that you have to keep them informed so that when they come into power, not everything is strange to them. Yes. So they get briefed almost the same as the city ministers. That doesn't happen in Africa, right? Because the winner takes all. Yeah. So what, what happens? When the politicians have now come to sell themselves, they tell the populace exactly what they want to hear, that they will fix all their problems, even though mm. they don't have the facts. Mm. They don't have the facts, right? They tell you that they will turn the economy around. They will provide jobs. They will do everything that you want, but they don't have the facts, right? Because they are not aware of it. Then yeah. when they get into government, they suddenly realize that they cannot deliver on anything they have promised. So they tell you, well, it's not my fault, right? It's the previous <laughs> government. So don't hold me accountable, right? And then the cycle is repeated, right? Because they tell uh -huh. you exactly what you want to hear. And those uh -huh. are the kind of leaders that we continue to create. But then we are not looking at why do we have these leaders? You know, I was thinking this morning, you know, as I was thinking about this our conversation today, I said, look, every, every leader today in Africa was born maybe 20, 30, I mean, forget about the, the ones that are 
perpetual, right? <laughs> <laughs> if you look at the, the political class, many of yes. them are maybe between 40 and 60, right? They were yeah. born 40 to 60 years ago. Yeah. They did not become politicians from the womb, right? They mm. came out from the rest of the populace. Yeah. So we need to ask ourselves, why are we creating a constant conveyor belt of corrupt, incompetent people? Right? Because we can, until we resolve this, this deep questions, we cannot have the leadership we want, right? Yeah. Because we need to understand that these people are coming from amongst us. They are not foreigners. They are exactly. not born politicians, right? So why is it that suddenly when they get there, they do exactly the things all of us complain about? And it's a yeah. constant conveyor belt of this same kind of people we get, right? But I'm not generalizing. You know, I try, when I talk about Africa, I try and put nuances to it, right? Mm. So I know that this is not like every politician is corrupt, right? Every country, they have challenges. We are not always the same. But generally, generally, we have a, a, an issue of leadership, right? The other thing, again, which I think is very interesting about leadership in Africa, is that when we then have the people we hold on to as leaders, you take a step back and say, is this the image of leadership you want? Mm. And I give an example. There's a particular leader in Africa that is celebrated by many Africans. Mm. But this leader is responsible for the chaos in the DRC. Mm. Right? Mm. We celebrate this particular leader as being the maybe, maybe I'm one of those. Uh, <laughs> yeah, as being an epitome of celebrate leadership. Us. That's fine. But we need to understand <laughs> that this same person is responsible, is part of those responsible for the ongoing crisis in another African country. So we need to reconcile what is it that we're looking for in a leader. Because you can't have all these, all these images we create in our mind that this is what we want to we Do we really want, as, as, as the yardstick, a leader that would cause instability in another African country? Mm. Now, Shala, I hear you. And I mostly agree with, with you. Okay? okay. The question is this. Why do you think we lack those institutions that we need to create? What's stopping us from creating those things? See, I, I have my view of, of that, but I want to hear, hear yours. I think um, somebody said something to me this year on LinkedIn that, that has been very profound for me. Another African said this to me, right? And we were having, there was somebody, had, if I remember correctly, somebody had raised a point around, you know, issues in Africa. And I said, can you be practical with me, please? Can you tell me, forget about this, these ideas. Can you tell me how you expect, oh, uh, yeah, I, I think this, this, if I remember correctly, this was the issue. The issue had to do with, I think, no, let me not make it up. I can't remember. But, 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 but the issue is this, right? And I said, can you just break it down to practical steps for me? What do you expect as yeah. a solution to this? Yeah. And the guy came to me and said, look, my brother, don't bother about this. Because in Africa, we are very good with blue sky thinking. Hmm. The problem is, is when you now begin to challenge people, please, can you break this down for me? Yeah. The practical steps. Yeah. They either get very touchy. Yeah. Or they move away from that subject because yeah. everybody is blue sky. All of us are blue sky they, thinkers. They, they cancel you. <laughs> yes. All of us are blue, blue sky thinkers, right? And that is one of the reasons I believe institutions are not being built. Okay. Because it is easy to whip up emotion. Yeah. It is easy to identify a problem. Yeah. It's easy to provide solution when nobody's asking you for accountability. Mm. Right? But when I say, I love your idea, but can you please tell me how I'm going to make that happen? Yeah. But you cannot do that. Right? And that is one of the reasons why we're not building institutions. Because we are not going down to the practical level to address the practical issues we have why those institutions don't exist. Okay. The second thing I said, and I, I mentioned it earlier, is that we have a very short-term approach to problem solving yeah right everybody that is in problem today wants a leader that will solve it in their life now now right now in the next few few months because if you don't then you're already tired and i fully understand that because i think i, I i've said this to you and we've had this conversation offline 
Africa is a traumatized continent. Mm. We are traumatized. And one of the issues with that is that people are already tired. The patience has been drawn. People don't have patience again because yeah. they've given a lot of long shots and nothing has come out from it. So I totally get that. But the truth about it is, you, we need to invest in those institutions, right? And one of the things we need to do is that we need to be ready to make the sacrifice. Okay. If you look at a country like Japan today, if you look at the, the, the history from the Second World War, right? There has been a lot of investment in creating a society for themselves. Yeah. Right? They have invested in creating a society. They had have, they have a vision of how they want to look like. And they've, they've slowly invested in that. Not everybody will get the benefit in their lifetime. Some of the politicians that started the joining will not see the result, but they understand that yeah. they are part of a conveyor belt. And they may not see the benefit, but they are ready to invest the effort in. Yeah. The other thing that is very important, right, in building institutions is we need to then identify those institutions we want to build, right? If you look at, for example, the political party structure in Africa, mm. it cannot give you strong leadership in many places because those parties either are not based on any principles yep. or they are put together by people that have vested interest. Now, people yep. are going to tell me, hey, in the US there's vested interest. I totally get that. But then you can understand until recently, right? You can understand if the difference between the Democrats yeah, and the and Republicans. Yes, yeah, yeah. Very clearly in their yeah. ideology, right? And sometimes you might have a few people floating in between the two, but generally, you yeah. know where they stand w for. When a, a Democrat speaks to you, yeah. without telling you I'm a Democrat, you know exactly where, he, yeah. where he's from. You the know same how... Thing Exactly, yeah. yeah. And then you know there are some that are center, left, center, right. So, but generally, left, yeah. Yeah. generally, mm. in Africa, you cannot say that. No. Right? Because we don't have that kind of ideology. That, that's right? that's why it's very easy for them to move ac across but, uh, party line all the time. It's all about victory. It doesn't yeah. matter which party it is, as long as you have power. Mm. Because there's no accountability anyway. So nobody's going to say, you're not following policy because, you know, you're not tied to any policy. What right? policy? Exactly. You, know, you kind of make it up as you go along. So the reason why we don't have this, for me, these are some of the reasons. We're not investing enough. We're very short term. And of course, we, are, we need to identify those institutions that we need to build, right? And yeah. then we need to start to build them. It is a, there's a lot of work from followers. This is not all about leadership. There's a lot of work. I was telling somebody the other day, right? One of the reasons why things work in different countries is because people have a vested interest. Yeah. Right? When you go to certain places, right? And you go to a hospital, for example, they don't expect you to give them bribes before they do their work. In fact, they will feel insulted if you offer them something because this is my job, right? So everybody knows they are part of it. Yeah. There is a, a strong commitment to the center, right? We are part of this. Right? So we hold each other accountable. I don't need the government to hold each other accountable. We hold each other accountable, right? Okay. It doesn't mean it works perfectly. And people will tell me where in the US there, is, there are drug problems, there are dirty streets. I know that. <laughs> but generally, people hold themselves accountable because there's something they take pride in yeah. in their country. They take a lot of pride in it, right? Now, let, 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 let me, sorry, let me just say this, okay? Yeah. Yes, we, we don't have a, a long-term plan or strategic uh, planning. That's one thing. But do you think many of us do not even know our history? We have never sat down to say, hey, this thing, let's look at the history of this, this particular stuff. Where did it start? And where do, where do, we, want it, where, where do we want it to go? See, 16th, 17th, 18th century, Europe did that, for, for example. That's when the Enlightenment philosophers came on board. And they, they, they hashed out so many different issues in their societies. Okay? Britain, France, Germany, you know? They, they did a lot of work, mm. a lot of intellectual work. Mm. And that is the foundation of this 
in institutions in, the, in, in Europe. Mm. And that's what the founders of America mm. took on board mm. to create that country. Mm. And that's the same thing that Japan mm. took to build a country. Mm. And that's the same thing that South Korea took to build a country. Mm. And even uh, Singapore mm. took some, some, of, some of that to build, to build their country. Mm. Now, why we that were colonized by these same Europeans, mm. but somehow we refuse to take all those things, sit down, hash them out, mm. and adapt them to our society. Mm. Why? Because we don't need to. We, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Mm. We just take them and then look at our society. Where does this fit? Mm. What do we need to change? Mm. But we haven't even done that. Mm. It's as if we want to build us from scratch or mm. we don't want to build it at all. Mm. Mm. What do you think? Um, you know, my, my first reaction to that question would be, where do we start from in terms of history? Okay. Do we start from before 1960, for example, Nigeria? Let's say Nigeria, mm. for example. Mm. We got independent in 1960. Do we yeah. take 1960 as a reference point? Okay. Or do we take prior to 1960 as a reference point okay. for talking about our history? The second thing for me is that, unfortunately, I think talking about history of Africa now is perhaps too late. Hmm. I think the horse has already bolted. If you go online, personally, the level of misinformation that is available now to be difficult it's to much. have a, a yeah to have an intellectual conversation about the history of Africa. No, but, but 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 we can see, for example, our uh, professors in our various schools in our various universities. See, once upon a time, once upon a time, most. African countries had at least one or two universities that were highly rated in the world mm. once upon a time. Mm. Okay. Mm. And see, my father in law is a, a retired professor now, mm. but the gentleman had, he, 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 at least his name is amongst those botanists that did work mm. a, a world renowned work mm. okay and we have so many other people across various areas of of academics mm. speakers mm. okay that did work mm. so our historians history teachers mm. at least they can do they can do some work uh Okay, now I would, I would, as much as I appreciate the passion <laughs> that you have exhibited here, um, personally, I think that that horse has bolted. Mm. And I think that nowadays you have to question what is intellectualism anyway. Okay. When it comes to certain conversation, because people are now um, gravitating towards the source rather than the content. Mm. The source of your information. I, 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 get, I get you. Yeah, that, that happens a lot. Yeah. So even if the most renowned professor of African history puts out a paper out there, you probably will be drowned out in the <laughs> other conversation going on, not just about the content, but the interpretation of that content. Mm. And if you look today online, you if you if you try and Google some of the subjects, you you really find professors and others part of that conversation you yes. usually will find a lot of people yes with with different P people uh, like me yeah different <laughs> data source out there you know so much as i agree with you that coming to terms with our history is a very important part of understanding our identity and building this future but i think that that conversation even and also with the powerful influence of disinformation 
I think we've gone beyond that. Um, I wish I was wrong, but my personal view is that we've gone beyond that. And we can talk about our history, but we need to be quite mindful that there's a lot of information out there that people have come to make up their mind about a lot of things. Yeah. So trying to then steer the conversation towards, let's talk about the history. Yes, but this means X, Y, Z. I mean, I've watched videos where people are discussing the history of Africa that I do not recognize. The I don't, I don't, I recognize the history, but the interpretation, I do not recognize it. Me too. And I, I, I did history, right, up to my um, YEC, right, okay. in those days. Yeah. So I did history. I know, you know, we studied ancient history. But we studied it in a more academic form, not mm. so much as interpreting what does that mean in today's yeah. world. So I get that that difference. But the interpretation has become more um, militant. Yeah. And sometimes there are things dropped there that are not supported by any evidence. Uh, by any mind. evidence, yes. Any evidence. But people buy into it because it fits into a narrative. Narrative, yeah. And therefore, it's very difficult then to go back and talk about, let's talk about the underlying substance, not the interpretation, right? But people have gone beyond that. So to come back to your point, yes, we should, but I'm not sure it's going to help us where we are now. Mm. Well, I... Uh... I'm we need sure. to do something. We need to do something because we can't continue this way. Yes. So to build to build those very needed institutions, we need to do some serious work. Yes. Well, let me tell you something. Again, one of the I think one of the big issues we have with with. I agree with you. We need to do something. I could. I can't tell you what it is we need to do. <laughs> um, I mean, we can look at different options, but it's 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 really challenging where we are now. And yeah. I'll give you an example. One of the key things for me is that we have come to accept contradictions as a way of life. How? In terms of politics. So okay. I'll give you an. I'll give you an example. Right. Um, if you look at ancient history, for example, right, if you look at the, let's take the Roman Catholic Church initially, yeah. right, they preached piety and the non-accumulation of wealth, why they were one of the R most richest wealthiest in the world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you go to the Third Reich under Hitler, yeah. right, they preached the ideal Aryan state, tall, blonde, blue eyes. Yeah. But when you look at the leadership of the Nazi party, yes. none of them look like that. <laughs> but they preached it to people that that is what it should look like. And yes. that is what the future looks like, right? Even though yes. they, some of them had limbs, some of them had deformities, but they preached it, right? Contradictions. Yeah. And that kind of has worked. Even if you look currently at some of the politicians, say, for example, let's take the US. Mm. Right? Let's take a very popular politician without mentioning names, right? Yeah. The evangelicals are strongly behind a, a political heavyweight in the US yeah. who has been convicted of, of basically sexually assaulting women, mm. right? Now let's come down to Africa, right? Recently, the president of, the, of, of South Africa, right? Yeah went on a peace mission to Ukraine mm. to ask the Ukrainians to give up their land. But he is the president of a country that fought to get their land from the white settlers. Okay. But then he goes to another country asking them to accept what the South Africans will not accept themselves. Mm. Right? When you look at some of the coups in Africa, right? Some of the people who celebrated the coupists yeah. and said democracy has not worked and some of these leaders have been sit tight for too long are themselves yes. citizens of countries where the leaders have been there for 40 years plus. Yeah. 
Take Cameroon, for example. Yeah. Right? And they, they say, well, you know, we, we should not have leaders that are just sitting there. For you. Yes, yes. So it's okay for them to be overthrown if, if, if they are not performing. But then they have president that is senile. I mean, basically, you know. And you can go on and on and on. I gave you an example earlier of, of an African president being celebrated as being the epitome of leadership when it's actually part of the problem in another African country, as even said by the leader of the DRC. The president of the DRC has categorically said that part of the problem they have is Rwanda. This is not secret, right? Mm. So when you now begin to accept contradictions as a norm, it becomes difficult to rationalize and make changes because logic goes out of the door. Mm. Mm. And so, that is part of our challenge now. Okay. Okay. You cannot hold people accountable if... if it's, it's difficult. <laughs> if you accept contradictions, so, right? So let, let, let's, let's dive into what I... I alluded to at the beginning yeah. that young Africans don't speak well of democracy. Okay? Yeah. Many African leaders are taking advantage of democracy. Like, like, like you mentioned, we have so many leaders who have been, in fact, I refer to them as uh, rule, rule to death. Hmm? It's like, it, they are like monarchies. Okay? Yeah. So, they, so they will be on, on the seat until they expire. Yeah. So, see, they do this to the detriment of their people. Yeah. Now, does democracy work in Africa? And what is the alternative? See, when those guys, these young people tell me they, they don't like democracy, and many of them also talk about because it's a Western thing. Okay, although I don't ag agree with that, I ask them, what is the alternative? Yeah. And nobody has ever come back to me. <laughs> okay, Kenneth. You know, it's a very good question, right? And it goes back to what one thing we discussed earlier. Mm. Everybody has blue sky thinking, but very people have ideas. And that okay. goes through the whole of the African, through the whole structure. Let me not say the whole continent, through the whole structure. The leaders really have solutions, but they blue sky thinking. The followers have blue sky thinking, and therefore we keep talking big. But then nothing happens because you need to convert your ideas into practical solutions, or somebody has to do it. You might be an yeah. ideas person, but you need somebody that will convert that to practical steps. Yes. So let me address your question, right? When people say democracy doesn't work, I do exactly the same thing you do, which is to ask, what are you proposing? Yes. Do? Because in the sense of it, democracy is not Western or Eastern. Democracy is a way of choosing your leaders. Yes. It, it's not Western or Eastern. It's not, it's, not, it's not, the Japanese use it, different countries use it. It's not West or East. It is a way of ensuring that the minority do not get taken off by the majority, simply because they do not have a voice, mm. right? If democracy hasn't worked in Africa, and there's no, no evidence to suggest it hasn't worked. And the reason why I would say that is this. When you focus on the leadership and the results, without looking at building institutions, it doesn't matter what you build on top of it. You will come back to the same spot. Okay. Now, when people say democracy doesn't work, they say the leaders we elect Either, sorry, the people we vote for, either the elections are rigged or they don't perform. And then when you say, okay, but what is the alternative? And somebody and some of them say, let's have military men. I say, but military men tick exactly the same box. They are neither elected because they just turn up one day and say, we're now your leaders. Yeah. There's no accountability for them and you cannot get them out. So what is the difference between the two? Tell me the difference. In the practical terms, forget about the stories. In the practical terms, what is the difference between the two? The difference is, the first one, you feel cheated, right? Because I went to vote. And, my and, vote and you, can, you can shout. You can go out yeah. and shout. Yeah. Okay. Sometimes you can't. We have to be okay. honest. Sometimes okay. you can't. But the second one also doesn't ask your permission, 
right? The two of them can perpetuate themselves in power, yeah, right? And the two of them may not deliver because the politicians don't have accountability. The soldiers don't have accountability. Mm. So you're about to square one. But the difference for most people is a strong man mentality. Yeah. Right? If you notice what has been happening now among the copies, they dress in a certain way. Right? Mm. People have come to establish this. It's like when you have Che Guevara. Yeah. Right? right? They've come to establish this persona of Sankara. Mm, oh, mm. We, we dress like him, we talk yeah. like him, yeah. We say we are like him. Yeah. So we sell you the idea and you're like, yeah. <laughs> I said one of the things that you should always do in Africa, right? Is that we should have the respectful skepticism. Respectful skepticism, right? Whether you're a military leader or a civilian leader, you have to deliver before I celebrate. Yeah. Your appearance does not cost me any joy to celebrate. Your results is what will determine whether you're a good leader or not. Right? Mm, mm, so mm. when people say democracy hasn't worked, right? Take, take example of the countries where it hasn't worked, right? And they are all over Africa. But if you look at it, in many of those countries, we've also tried military rule and it hasn't worked. Yeah. Right? In many of those African countries. When you go step forward and say, do you want monarchy? Because monarchy suffers from the same thing. Monarchy yeah. is not based on competence. It's mm -hmm. based on when you were born, right? So you become king. The only thing is you might kill your brothers and sisters, so you become <laughs> king, right? So you get quickly to the top of the king, right? <laughs> but this thing is, it is not the systems that matters. It is the institution that would matter. But people don't understand that. Again, because we're traumatized. Right, we have tried different things, and people are simply tired. They want a savior. It goes back to what I said earlier about the itinerant pastor. People want saviors, and if you come in looking like a savior, they gravitate towards you because they just want somebody to save them. Yeah, they don't care the system; they just want somebody to save them. But the problem with looking for a savior is that even if you get a savior, because there is no structure, you cannot replicate it. Yeah, right. You cannot replicate that good work. Right? Because it's either the guy dies and there's no replacement, he's killed, there's no replacement, or he leaves office and there's no adequate replacement. Right? I was reading the other day about Rwanda about the fact that, you know, Kagame wants to go for another term. And people said, oh, yeah, yeah, he should, he should stay. And, 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 and because he's doing such a fantastic job, why do you want to change him? But the fact is, if he doesn't have a successor one day, he said that he becomes too old, in which case he can't function. None of us Cameroon, has... Cameroon. Yeah, right? So when you have this, this lack of structure, lack, lack of a conveyor belt, lack of institutions, right? We rely on a savior, right? And when the savior doesn't work, we go back to square one because everything is broken down and you go back to the beginning, right? So for me, yes, people are right to say democracy hasn't worked, but none of the others have worked. So... When you when you celebrate one over the other, you need to understand what is it that I'm celebrating, right? what is it that I'm asking for. If you say, I don't care what system, that doesn't work also, because that means yeah. that there's no structure. You can't say, I don't care, as long as it's a good leader. But what is a good leader, right? If a military man comes in today, you will not know whether it's good or not for the next maybe three, four, five years. Yeah. Right? It's not like you're going to know by tomorrow, right? If a politician comes in, at least you know in three years you can vote him out. Yes. Yeah. You might not be able to. In four years, at least you can vote him out, right? If a king is there until he dies, or dies. his brother, or somebody go. kills him, it doesn't go, right? Yeah. So democracy at least gives you some level of comfort that yeah. you may be able to change, yeah. right? But to me, the problem is not the system of government. Mm. The problem is we need to decisions. We need to ask ourselves, what do we want? Yeah. But we cannot have military man today, civilian tomorrow, king tomorrow, as long as you are performing, we don't care. Because you cannot build a country without some form of structure. Yeah. Because that means you don't even know how you're going to replace the current government. Yeah. See, uh, well said. Uh, see, what, what I focus on, what I discuss these things with uh, young Africans is this. I ask one gentleman, I can't remember what, what country, but he's uh, a small country. I asked him, tell me, 
how many tribes do you have in your country? He said 77. That's what he told me. I said, okay. Mm -hmm. So democracy, you don't want the democracy. Okay. So what do you want? Do you want military? He said, no. Okay. I say monarchy. How many kings do you have in your, in your, in your country? He said, ah, he doesn't know. There are thousands. The, every, every village has a chief or king. Okay. I said, okay, good. So which one of those kings is going to, is going to become your leader of the country? See, uh, we might not want a democracy. My, myself, I am not a, a fan of democracy for a different reason. Okay. But democracy to me is the only way for a very diverse society to at least choose one person or a group of people to govern the, the country or a state because we are so diverse. See, I tell people, I say this to people and uh, they get angry at me. I say, yes, you, more, you might be angry about colonialism, okay? But what would we be right now if we're not forced into states? See, many people don't realize that because he was telling me about uh, the, the amount of wars that Europe, that the, the Europeans like wars. Okay. I told him, okay, let me tell you. If we in Africa of over 3,000 tribes were not forced into statehood in small, small groups and were left as we were 500, 500 years ago, what do you think will be happening right now? See, because in, in Nigeria, for example, by the time the British were, were domina do dominating the, the South, the Fulanese were dominating for the, for the North. So assuming the British were not there, okay, the Fulanese would have conquered all through from the north to south, or maybe two or three other tribes will now come together to defeat them. And that will continue all through from Nigeria, the area, area of Nigeria into Cameroon, into uh, Gabon, I mean. So see, we as a continent of very diverse peoples, Democracy, at least it, it has done one thing, it has saved us from ourselves. <laughs> so, yeah, it has can saved I, us. Yeah. Can I, let, me just, let me just say something to what you said, which is, which I find um, refreshing in a way, but also um, it, it leads to the disinformation that is out there. Mm. A lot of people, and that's the thing about, um, I wrote an article yesterday on, on Black History Month. And one of the things that we find is, um, I find is that because we're a, we're not a homogeneous group, Africans. We're not right? at all. Black people, actually, we're not. At all. Some of us uh, learned about African history in school. And I understand that a significant amount did not. So they are kind of coming to terms with some of these stories and empires and great people now. I get that, right? But when you listen to people talk, you would think that they talk about an African unity. Yes. As if before colonialism, we were one group of people. I've, I've been, I've been, I've been arguing this way. <laughs> and, we did, and we did kumbaya with each other. Yes. We were <laughs> fighting each other, right? We were fighting wars with each other. Hamlets against Hamlets. Yes. Right? Tribes against tribes. Right? My, we grandfa my grandfather, 
my grandfather yeah. died from such words. Yeah. The, you the, know? Ma, the, ma, the man called Barney. Yeah. That's my son. Yeah. You know, died from, 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 from this war, exactly. War. Yeah. So, so when people say, you know, Africans are going to get into one, into a unity, and I say, okay. Against, I mean, when has that happened before? Can we have a reference <laughs> exactly. point? Exactly. Because for you to suddenly say, you know, Africans are going to be united as one. Uh, and, and I've had this conversation with people and I say, so what do you mean by African unity? Oh, we're going to have one continent, you know, one president, well, sorry, one leader, one currency, one language. And I say, really? I mean, even now in the, in, in the different countries, they cannot agree. And you're talking of the whole continent with thousands and thousands of, of tribes, you know. So I think again, it's part of the 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 disinformation out there. Yeah. This idea that somehow we are one homogeneous group, or we can make ourselves simply it, by talking about it. Yeah. yeah. See, so. that's uh, that's something that uh, I've I've uh, tried to lead some people to look at it. You see. Africa is so diverse. I, I said, I use the word dive, Africa is diverse to let them understand that what they are thinking about is fairy tales. Yeah. It's fairy tales. See, yeah. and you know, what do they understand is this? If young Africans are so ignorant of Africa, of the diversity of Africa and the history of Africa, do you know who are not that ignorant? The, the, the colonial masters, China, Russia, Japan, they know how diverse Africa is and, and they know how much we are fighting ourselves before we are colonized. So if young Africans at this time in the 20th, 21st century are so clueless of their history, that gives those guys, those people who think are, are, are enemies, all the ammunition to conquer us again. Yeah. Okay? Because if you don't know your continent, you're actually giving them all the ammunition, they can tell you anything, and you believe. Yes. And ex that's exactly what is going on online. Yes, and the thing about it is, um, which brings me to another favorite topic in Africa, um, it's all about populism. Yeah. And populism has taken hold in Africa because populism gives you Chris an enemy for you, and also creates um, some rationale for you to be a victim of some sort. Yeah. And that, that, that drives you. So the idea is that for some reason, if not for these people, we'll be united as one. Yeah. It's these people that are stopping us from being united. And if we can get ourselves back to this united Africa, then you know, we'll start to make progress. But when you begin to ask people what the people that are, are pushing this idea, what is a united Africa? What does it, what will it look like in practical terms? You see, I, I come back to this thing, right? Because many years ago, I was telling someone, right, that if you if you open an office somewhere and you put all the white papers, the the communicates, the you know, all these things from all these conferences and all this talk about. Africa, you fill a whole building with it, right? Let's stop all this blue sky thinking, right? Let's start to talk about how we turn these ideas into practical text, right? Yeah. So that we can start to get some people out of the room who simply don't have a clue, right? <laughs> so that we stop listening to people that will just whip up sentiment and walk away and will not be able to give us practical solutions. We need to ask ourselves, what does the United Africa mean? Let's forget the populist agenda. Let's forget this emotional, you know, roller coaster we get on about our enemies, about how we can be great, about how, you know, we are able. Let's talk about what does that mean when we say United Africa? What are we looking for? What would that look like? And what is the example of this United Africa that we talk about, right? 
And to me, that's that's just the issue here, right? So yeah. when people are saying that they want United, like you said, they do not understand some of the nuances of this continent we reside in, right? And they get themselves so worked up, so worked up, right, about how anybody that doesn't understand is an enemy. Anybody and that doesn't buy to that idea is an that's, enemy that's what, of that's what gets That's what gets me <laughs> laughing sometimes. Yeah. You're an enemy, enemy of progress if you do not buy into this idea that somehow there's a renaissance coming on where Africa will be united. We are going to be a powerful force. And that is great. But let's talk about what does that look like? Because we will not get to... If you don't know what it looks like, looks how like. can you know where you get there? That's it. That's it. That's yeah. it. How do you know you are there if you don't know what it looks like? So let's talk about what it will look like. And then we can say, okay, is it possible? Is it practical? Is it is it achievable? Is it a a hundred year journey that we need to start now? But mm -hmm. let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about see, it. Yeah. They they don't see. Unfortunately, they don't understand that Europe we see today. They have been on a two thousand year journey. Middle East we see today has been on a 5,000-year 5, journey. <laughs> That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, as, mm -hmm. as, as people who know each other mm -hmm. and has been fighting one another mm -hmm. for that long, mm -hmm. most of us do not know the next group that lived a hundred kilo kilometers from our village. We didn't know that they existed at all. Mm -hmm. So, see, telling people about about this annoys a lot of people mm -hmm. because it seems you are saying we are so backward, and yeah. it annoys people. Mm -hmm. Anyway, let's leave it, that. I, I think I think one of the things that annoys them, right, and 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 is that again it comes down to the short term. Mm. People, again, because you have been, there's a lot of sentiment, there's a lot of emotional um, capital that they invested in this. Yeah. That people think that when you then want to sit them down to have a an intellectual, rational conversation about what is it that you mean, they get upset. Because a lot of them have not, in my view, and I may be totally wrong, a lot of people have not given a lot of thought to what does this mean mm. when you say something, right? Because it's easy to say something and move on. Yeah. When people challenge you to say, what is it you're talking about? And the other thing, again, I think is important to, for, that we should mention is that we are now awash with experts. Everywhere. I mean, it's amazing. They are experts. And why are there so many experts? Because where there's a crisis, people see opportunity. Yeah. So now you see a lot of experts on Africa. And they generate, everything they generate whips up emotion. Yeah. Without necessarily being backed by intellectual conversation, yeah, to whip up emotion, and and, and 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 that's that's something that, I mean, oh god, see, shall I, <laughs> let, let's, leave, on let's on. leave this <laughs> matter for now. <laughs> we can go on and on, right? <laughs> anyway, yeah. see, so something else I, I want to talk to talk to you about. You you have already alluded to it. See, I've been I've been listening to many speeches, you know. Yeah. Eh? Uh, politicians and business leaders speeches, speeches, speeches eh? <laughs> they say yes. fantastic things absolutely mm? how do we hold <laughs> this accountable how do we do that, how do we do that how do we do that what's your view <laughs> oh okay, where do we start um, I think I I am am if I'm a by, by the way by the way by the way I I like I like speeches okay yes. I was going <laughs> to say that I, I'm I'm a, I'm a big fan of speeches okay right? and many years ago I actually wanted to be a speech to, to be a speech writer okay because I think there is and and the truth is there's a lot of power in speeches mm. um one of the people that and I do not, I have not agree with everything he did. But one of the people that I, I listen to their speeches, and I do still listen to, 
is Winston Churchill. Right? Okay. I listened to some of his speeches that he delivered at that critical moment. Not yeah. everything, but at that critical moment, because some of it... Um, Galvanized the think, whole country. Yeah. yeah, made me think about the use of words. Mm. The way he said certain things. And I thought to myself, it must be hard to go to bed every day asking people to sacrifice so much, knowing that every minute people are dying, but you have to do this, right? Yeah. You have to keep whipping them up. And I've enjoyed some of the speeches from Obama. I've enjoyed some of the speeches from Martin Luther King. So I, I read yeah. speeches and I think yeah. that some of they are very powerful. The issue I have currently with these speeches is that a lot of politicians in Africa, let's talk about Africa. It yeah. happens across, but let's talk about Africa. Yeah. They talk out of the room. Right? They talk what do you out that? of the room. What do you mean? So they say we should be doing this. Okay. Right? They say these are the things that need to be done. But my issue with that is that as a leader, there are certain things within your control, within your sphere of influence. Not everything requires a speech without action, right? Because a lot of things are within your sphere of influence. Okay. When you act and say, this is what we have done, that is a speech. When everything is about, this is what we should do, even mm -hmm. though some of it are within your sphere of influence. To me, there's something wrong with that, right? Because as a leader, I can whip up a lot of emotion and sentiment in people to say, you know, this is what we should do. This is what, you know, and these are the reasons, these are the enemies, these are the blockages we're doing it. But why don't you do the ones within your control? And say, I've, I've done this as an example, but we could have done more if not for these blockages. So I'll give you an example, right? Okay. I've listened to leaders in Africa in recent, in recent memory talk about the financial institutions in the West, how they are causing blockages to progress, right? Mm. And sometimes one of the key things that have been discussed recently is why do we need to transact in the US dollars okay. when, you know, we are when we're doing transactions locally? Yeah. And one of the things I thought to myself when I listened to some of these leaders talk is, so let's agree that, that and I agree, right? Yeah. If you think about it, it is not always logical. There are reasons why people do use the US dollar, for example, right? To, to, for their transactions, you know, stability and all that, right? But I also understand that that should be an option, not be the default in every case. Right? Mm. So I ask myself, why can't these countries, this leader who is in this room telling us about all this, initiate some form of example of how that can be done using transactions from the government or intergovernment? Right. Mm, mm. So if the president of Uganda and Tanzania, as an example, are talking about this, why don't they do some transactions between both governments in yeah. local currency? Yeah. Or why can't they say going forward, we will not issue contracts in dollars again? Right. All our contracts or for certain transactions will only be done in our local currency. Mm. Right. Because we don't see the need why a local supplier should be paid in dollars. Let's yeah. start to have some practical action. But what do we do? We don't talk about these things. So they tell us about, you know, we should do this, we should do this, we should do this, right? Which is fine. But my question is, what are what are the things within your sphere of influence? Why don't you do them, right? And that to me is where populism comes in. Yeah. Right? Populism gives you these big speeches. Yeah. Tells you about the things that we need to do. Tells you about the problems that they have. Yes. But then it stops you from asking the other question, but what are the other things that we can do? Okay. Instead of spending time talking about all the things what we can do. What, what can I do? Yeah. Let's talk about within that problem, what is it that your government can do? Because there must be something. You are the leader of a country. There must be something, you know. And when is an intra-African issue where four or five presidents are talking about it, yeah. why can't four or five of you come together and say, okay, we're going to set an example for the rest of Africa through these five countries in doing those transactions in local currency, Yeah. right? Instead of putting everything out there to say, I was, I watched, um, there was a video, I'm trying to remember now, but I remember, I think it was um, Tabo Mbeki that was talking. He was on the floor and there were some African leaders on the platform, Obasanjo and a few people. And they were talking about this peer review that they had years ago for African leaders, right? And I thought to myself, why? 
talk about these things as if you are not the people that need to review yourself. Okay. <laughs> right? Why talk about review? Why do you say this is what we are doing rather than say this is what we should do? This is what we need to do, right? And that is my problem with the speeches. There's a lot of speeches going on now. There's a lot of finger pointing, right? Mm. And the problem is where you then direct all your energy at the, at the problem and keep pointing. Um, if you, I'll give you a good example, right? I think it's a good example. If you look at some of the countries where they have been caused recently, yeah, right? Everything is being pointed at France. Yeah. And the West, right? For the problems. But these same countries are not really giving us an idea of the other things that are not French related that they are doing, right? Because not everything in the country is France, France, France. Okay. Not everything in the country is the West, 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 right? But everything is about these are the problems. These are the people causing a problem, right? And to me, that is populism. And we need to move away from those speeches and start to talk about. Yes, there are problems, but these are the things that the countries and leaders are doing in practical terms to solve some of the problems within their control. Yeah. And I think that's the problem I have with the speeches. Because the speeches, to me, just whip up sentiment, whip up emotion, get you really driven about, you know, all the problems that, you know, the financial institutions are causing the West. And, and when you have conversation, the interesting thing is I've had conversation with other Africans about this, right? The emotion is so powerful in these speeches that they do not even want to discuss mm. the alternative. They just want to be whipped up about this. I use okay. the word whip up a lot. They, they are so emotional about this. And when you say, uh, but, but what exactly are you saying? What exactly is this leader saying? You are treated as if you are, you are an agent of the West because you should not be questioning these things. Good. See, that, that's, what, that's what scares me for us. Okay, we get so emotional that nobody can actually ask any relevant question because when you ask questions and the question doesn't point fingers to the West, you're asking, what can we do? We, we. Yeah. It's as if this, this guy is an agent. Yeah. See, on see, I will say this. No matter what the West has done to Africa and what it will continue doing, okay, because it will continue doing, and China will continue doing, okay, no matter what any external party does in Africa. Mm -hmm. To me, maybe I'm wrong. It's not enough to keep us where we are today. In my mind, in my view, we are where we are today because of the things we did or the things we didn't do. Because in truth, No country in the world today has developed without somebody trying to stop them. Mm. Nobody. So if anybody has done it, we can do it. Um. What I would say to that, Ekene, is this, right? I, I, um, I have absolutely no issues with people getting emotional because I think emotions are good. They are part yeah, of okay. life. They are valid. But when emotional, when it stops us having a rational, intellectual conversation, it defeats the purpose. Yeah. Become a rabble that simply just go with one thought process. Mm. And it has really worked in the past. Right. It has never, it has never really worked. Yeah. Anyway, when, the, when when people cannot break down the speeches being told by leaders, or cannot be skeptical of the intention of a leader, just to accept on face value, then it's a society that is 
creating a lot of problem for itself. And I agree with you that, you know, if we look at, really look at where we are today, we cannot divorce ourselves from the consequences of, our, of where we are today. Yeah. We cannot hold our hands up and say, everything has been done to us, right? But there's, there's an interesting argument to that. Okay. And people have said that, yes, they agree we have a hand in it, but that hand is also the, the fault of the West. Because, yeah, because they have either corrupted our brothers and sisters to do those things. Our brothers and sisters have sold us, so it's not our fault, really. Okay. So or, no, no agency. Okay. I told somebody, I, 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 made it, I, made this, I made this analogy, right? And, and people laughed about it. Let me give you the analogy, right? I'll give you this analogy, right? You and I come from Nigeria, right? You might mm -hmm. recognize this, see? Yes. When a man or woman does something wrong back home, mm. his, his, his other half will go to the pastor, right? Yes, yes. And the pastor will say, it is your mother-in-law. Yes. <laughs> Don't blame the man or the woman. It is the mother-in-law yes. that's the problem. So it takes away the responsibility. So they yes. start to fire prayer at the mother-in-law <laughs> as a problem. And then the mother-in-law dies. And you think that there's peace. And they say, no, 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 no. She's still after you from the grave. <laughs> so it is not, it is not your fault. It is the fault of the mother-in-law. And when you would have prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing is happening. Then the pastor will come and say, look, it is the devil. We have to fight the devil, devil. Because the devil is the one that is causing this problem. So at no point do you become responsible for your action. It is no. always somebody else's fault. Okay. By where you are, right? Okay. And we have built this culture up of no responsibility, right? I was telling somebody many years ago that Nigeria is one of the few countries I know where people will go to vote on Saturday. The result gets announced on Saturday night, for example, and on Sunday they are in church praying that God should touch the heart of the politician yes. to, do the, to do the right thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> that God, please touch this man. They are not asking the man to be accountable, but they want God to go and touch so that mm. the devil, the devil will not use him against us. Okay, right, and that is what we'll do for the next four years, and then oh, we we'll go man. back again and do the same thing, right? So we don't accept responsibility. It comes back to what I said. In my view we are a traumatized continent. Okay. And all these things are reflective of the trauma we have gone through. Mm. The trauma has been caused by our colonial masters. We, they cannot, we cannot divorce them. They have been caused by our own leaders who have, who have done a lot of things to us. But they have also been caused by our followers okay. by simply not doing the right thing. So we're traumatized. Okay. And that is why some of the things we do does not make sense. Logically, wow. they don't make sense because we're traumatized. Okay. And we need to come to a place of healing, in my view, for us to move forward. Okay, Shola, on that note, on that note, we end this discussion. See, ne next discussion, you know, me and you, and maybe we'll bring somebody to discuss this trauma issue. Because I will tell you, yes, I agree to an extent, but me, I'm always, be, always on the side of personal responsibility in everything. All right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Shala, <laughs> thank you very much be, to being here today. today. It's my pleasure. Can it's All my right. pleasure always. All right. Where she going? All right. Thank okay, you. now take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Yeah.